Thank you to the B4 student chapter for inviting me. Um, the first question is, can you hear me okay? Is it too loud, too noisy, or it's fine? I think it's okay. Yes. Yeah, okay, great. Okay, so um, as Camila mentioned already, I did my PhD in uh, Germany, and the topic of the PhD was on optical communication. And um, that I have photonics also. Um, that one of the reasons why I choose this topic for the talk, but also because it's a quite relevant topic involving basically all of us, as this technology is widespread. And uh, there are some issues that maybe we can help as photonic um, researchers. So why is it involving all of us, or why do we need really the, the title? Why? we want faster and efficient internet connectivity well because as humans um, we want more right always go for more things and technology is everything but stopping so it's increasing to satisfy our demand for more and you can see that evolution over the last 10 years or so in a nice picture that um yeah, i like to to show so it's a bit, a bit updated, but um, in this picture, you can see already the evolution of how technology has influenced the, us as humans. This is what is taken in the Vatican City um, into a relatively important event, uh, mostly for Italians, right? which is the election of the Pope. It was back in 2005 um, where, when Pope Benedict um, was elected. And you see, yes, a small. <laughs> Nokia probably uh, phones, but nothing else. But how in period of eight years, um, yeah, this evolution has changed drastically how we interact with the world. Um, so over the last, yeah, starting in 2005 and so on, there has been an increase of this uh, phone. But what is impacting us now is the so-called Internet of Things, or um, um, IoT. For sure. Sure. And um, that is the trend now, where you can see really millions of devices appearing. Some for niche areas, maybe such as smart pet feeder, so for those uh, cat lovers, like oh, he has a really nice, fine smart components like that. But it's also wide. Uh, it has also wide reach application, and one of the most important nowadays that. There are many research groups in the world trying to, to accomplish is smart traffic. You know, traffic in the world is a big issue, not only traffic jams, but also accidents and um, you have the deaths of millions of people every year. And uh, there is a huge part of the community who believe that the smart traffic, which means cleverly, smartly interconnecting all of the all of the transport, will prevent these things. So there is a continuous growth of these applications that require more and more data, more efficient, faster, low latency, so that they can speak to each other fast and so on. And there is a crazy trend nowadays. So if you look at the statistics, the number of active devices, so wired or wireless devices connected to the internet is growing exponentially, mostly for the internet of things devices. The non-internet things, those are smartphones, computers, laptops, they are kind of stationary now. You saw the photo in the first slide around 2013. You see that the trend kind of caught stationary after that year. But the internet of things devices are exploding. And those relate to consumers, such as these niche applications, smartphone, uh, sorry, smart um, wristwatches, smart other, other things, TVs, and so on. But in the industry is also hitting strong there, where they are really intercommunicating all of the uh, technology inside. Also in infrastructure, with uh, you can think of sensors, millions of sensors. We have a, a nice group here with um, fiber sensors, for instance, if you want to intercommunicate all of those uh, with data. Or also in the military, drones, um, yeah, ranging application. So it, that's the reason why it's um, increasing exponentially. What does it mean that that the ICT community or information 
and communications technology needs really high requirements. Sure. I depict three here. One is the higher capacity, basically more data. And you see here a plot on how the traffic has been increasing over the last years. That's a log, logarithmic scale. And you see that at the early ages of internet, we had only two terabytes. That means that this is the worldwide traffic back in 1987, two terabytes. As a comparison, if you look at the Frankfurt Internet Exchange point now, so I took a look yesterday, at a given time, it has more than terabytes per second, or it is in terabit per second. And that's just one exchange point in Frankfurt. Exchange point is where data comes together and is distributed to the internet providers, telephone providers, and so on. So already now we have a huge amount of data. And in 2020, the amount of data reached beyond the data byte per second. It's important also low cost and energy consumption and uh, lower latency of faster communications. And I will come back to this point um, later on. Um, and you can see a clear trend in this same um, internet exchange point over the last five years. So it has increased from eight to 16 uh, terabit per second. Okay, so the ICT for um, information and communications technology, it's increasing, it needs more capacity, low latency and so on. The question is how does this look? What is the ICT? This is a simplistic picture of the architecture of the backbone internet architecture. So what brings us internet to our devices? We are typically the user end, so that's us with the smartphones and with or tablets. We typically get the data from towers, these uh, 5G, 4G towers, wireless, or via um, fiber, right? If you have Ethernet connection. But all of that is at the end. That is, uh, that is what's called the radio access network, which is dominated basically with, um, by wireless communication and also this um, fiber communication. Um, all of that data at the end needs to be processed, stored, reorganized. That's done by um, servers or data centers. For low latency now in uh, 5G, the new technology, the fifth generation technology, um, there are centers, data centers and servers at the edge. You may have heard of cloud computing. Cloud computing is okay, but the latency, the time you take the data to go to the place where cloud computing happens, it's too slow. So what now is the trend is the POC computing. So POC is closer to the people, right? It's again the um, comparison with cloud being too far and POC too close, and that's needed for low latency. And at the end, all is, uh, yeah, the internet is the data centers, cloud computing, and so on, with millions of package routers, and so on. I'd like to, the, to divide this into two parts. One is, say, wireless. How important is it for us to receive this data to our devices? We need low latency, but also it's okay if we have low capacity. We don't need terabit per second. We just need few megabytes per second. And those wireless, they work at carrier frequencies of, you may hear 2.4 gigahertz, but your smartphone works at 2.4 or 5 gigahertz. But now with the coming of the fifth generation, this will increase to 6 gigahertz, 30 gigahertz, and up to 3 terahertz with available bandwidths of like 100 of gigahertz. And then we have the second part, which is the fiber web guide. Those are involving carrier frequencies. So that's where the information is transported in the optical domain or the near infrared. So from 18, 850 nanometers to 1550 nanometers, which in frequency is more than uh, 200 terahertz. The advantage is that we work at so high frequency that the available bandwidth is huge. You could use 10 terahertz to transmit data. So here you have higher capacity, but it needs to be cheap and involving low power consumption. 
This is basically the core of my uh, presentation. I will go through these two sections, fiber and wireless, and explain how aphotonics can help um, to obtain yeah, more data, more capacity, and more efficient. Why we want energy efficient um, optical communications technology? Where the question is, what's happening here? Are we screwing the Earth? If you look at the numbers of the ICT or information and communication technology in terms of energy consumption, this is something that maybe we don't hear often, but back in 2019, the worldwide, worldwide consumption was around 23,500 terabyte hour with around 10% coming directly from the ICT industry. And as ICT advances, we see five, uh, fifth generation, sixth generation, it will consume more energy. And now we've witnessed the emergence of new applications of like crypto and blockchain technology, which also probably you've seen in the news, devolve a huge amount of energy. As an example, Bitcoin, you can track the energy consumption just Bitcoin. Um, in the present, it consumes around 100 terawatt hour. That is more than Belgium that consumes only around 82 terawatt hour. The forecast is not better. The consumption predicted for the next seven, eight years is predicted here in terawatt hour, with yeah, the limit being nine terawatt hour. But there are four, four sources of energy consumption, data centers and networks are gonna consume the most. The reason is that we need more place to store our data to process, and that's done in data centers. And we need more networks to transfer the data to us, the end user. More antennas, you will see every time more antennas being placed in your city. And all that will be consuming a huge amount of data. The question is then, if I and the demand yeah, is not going to slow down. So you see, I think a uh, logarithmic increase of the energy. And that's why we go to photonics. How can photonics um, help us? That uh, leads to my outline. As I said, I will talk mostly about two parts. The first one being fiber based communication that involve, involve um, data center to the right edge of the architecture, data center, servers, and links connected by fibers. And I will discuss why right? um, it's an advantage to use fiber based and optic. I'll show the state of the art, what are the issues, and some technologies that are being implemented and researched. And then I'll jump to the wireless communication section. I'll show yeah, what are the latest trends, so 5G and beyond, 6G, and so on. Notice that here the G is generation, not um, gigabyte or anything. Um, and what will be the role of terahertz photonics and um, why we will need terahertz photonics and in particular terahertz signal processing. Okay, with that, I start a bit the more technical part of this uh, talk. Um, the first part is to motivate the need of fiber communications. I mean, fiber communications is already widespread, so we don't need to um, really introduce it. It's already there. But to give an idea of why, um, here is a comparison of uh, two types of using copper, and one is um, optics using fiber. And you may already know that copper has high losses, so you are limited in the transmission distance, and the bandwidth is limited. Also, uh, you may have interferences. So, to process the data is great because you are already in the electronic domain, very simple. You go to the processor directly and you process it. Um, another thing is you have power. You can transmit power also if you want to power your devices. With fiber, you cannot yet transmit power to power your devices at the end of the fiber, but this is still in ex experimental research, so may come soon. But the important are to ask the low the band. And that the wireless fiber, wavegate, and so on. 
And that can be explained with um, simple rules. If you consider this uh, per cable here, you know that the bandwidth of the data you can transfer on this copper cable scales as the RC constant, one over the RC constant. So this is four minus one. And that is proportional to the area divided by the length of this, uh, of this wire. That just comes from the fact that the capacitance is proportional to the length and the resistance is proportional to the length uh, divided by the area. Now, with the problem, you would say, okay, if I want to increase the bandwidth, let's do it maybe shorter. But if you do it shorter, then the RE also decreases. That leads to the universal form of scaling. That capacity cannot be increased by making the system smaller. So to do it smaller will lead to the same capacity. Why? Because the length is reduced, but also the, the area. In addition, the power um, is proportional to the capacitance uh, times the voltage square. So you increase also the, the power. With fiber and waveguide, that doesn't happen. You decouple those things and you have um, low losses. So at the end, if you want to transmit huge amount of data with copper, that was okay back 20 years, 30 years ago, because the amount of data was um, really small. But now we want to transmit terabit per second of data. You would need hundreds, if not thousands, of copper cables, and that is impossible to scale up. That's the reason why we went with fibers in all data centers, and you see optical fibers. Now, okay, fibers is good, opticals is good, but at which scale? That's a question. I mean, you can go to data centers, you know of transatlantic connections with fibers, but fine. But how small can you go? When do we replace optics? When do we replace the, the copper, the electronic transmission by optics? And that has been happening over the years as technology in optics and photonics advanced. We've gone from replacing 100 kilometers, hundreds of kilometers of um, yeah, electronic cables, copper cables with fiber, ready back in the 90s and uh, late 80s. And as technology advanced, we've been using them for shorter distance, also because they become more efficient and so on. And we want to also go to chip to chip and on chip even. One question you may wonder is, wait, when I study optics and photonics, I know the, the laser, which is what is used to transmit data, was in the photos I in 1970. Why did it took that long um, to start using fibers and light to transmit data? That's because of another device that yeah, not many, many people talk about this, and it's very relevant to our um, fiber communication. And it's the EDFA, the Erbium Dope Fiber Amplifier. That's the one that was invented um, around 1987 that allowed to transmit data over hundreds and thousands of kilometers. That's what is used under the sea to transmit the data, EDFAs. And also web and division multiplexing, which allows to transmit more data. And I will come back to that. Okay, so there is a huge range of applications. The one I will talk now over the next um, slide involves one of the most important, which is um, metro and data center applications, because that's the one involving most of the of the data. If you see here a graphic of the data involved in each step. 73% approximately of the data of the data traffic happens within the data center for storing, generation, processing of data. While around eight, nine percent of data goes from data center to data center, and 20% is the data coming to us, the, the end user. So most of the this data um, traffic happens within the data center. That means that most of the energy is consumed there. That's one of the reasons why the forecast predicts this huge energy consumption um, in data centers. Now, how this uh, optical communication work? I'll give here a, a very simple um, yeah, approach or simple technique, which is actually the one 
most used in data center. So the question is how the data is actually transmitted within a data center or between uh, data centers. This is used, and this is done using so-called transceiver. This is a transmitter plus a receiver combined in the same module. And they typically use simple modulation format. That's how you transmit data. You modulate your information into the light. And one of the most common is um, pulse amplitude modulation or, or PAM. How it works is that you have a transmitter, that's the top part, where you have your signal coming, maybe 25 gigabytes of signal, electronic data generated from your computer, for example. And you have four computers. You can parallel with that. That comes from a device. So first, you need to provide the clock to your model that's done by this. And the signal to modulate your laser your um, laser diode. This is the laser driver that will modulate then the laser diode. You can parallelize that, and that's how it's done now. And then multiply them, join them all together into a single mode fiber, just a fiber that goes to another device. And the receiver is similar, the opposite. You receive the signal and then demultiplex the wavelength. So each of these lasers work at a different wavelength, and then demultiplex each of them you have a photodiode EIN junction that gives you current that is amplified by the transient heating amplifier. At the end, you have a voltage, which you can process again to recover the clock, and then you get your 25, for example, gigabit of data to your computer, right? So this is the basic principle. You can improve it, as you see. You can imagine you can scale it up, adding more lasers, or adding more complex modulations. Here I told you pulse amplitude modulation. So you change the um, amplitude of your emitted um, light, but you can do a bit more complex. You can modulate the phase and the polarization, you name it. And this is how it looks, the device. So photonics are already there because you are combining optics and, um, and device, uh, components such as lasers and photodiodes. This is one of the most widespread transmitter and receiver, transceiver in data center. You see the device here depicted, you see the board, and the small photonic chip um, in the middle. So that's very small micrometer size, um, size photonic chip. And the transmitter for you introduce your data, um, yeah, you have the optical interface, you have the DSP, the digital core, and then the, the receiver. You can buy, if you have enough money to build your own server, you could buy 99 euros or 120 with the um, with access. And uh, then you have your 100 gigabyte, uh, gigabit per second transceiver. You can, if you are fancy, you can buy even more, 800 gigabit per second. And then you can buy your uh, server where you would be receiving terabit per second data. So if you want to um, start transmitting a lot of information to a small group, you can go with it. But what's the problem then? I mean, you would say, okay, this is pretty cool. 800 sounds a lot. I mean, I wish my phone would receive that or my computer. So I don't see the problem. But the, there is a problem. Um, this image kind of shows a radio in. So here I showed this small radio, which is used in each in 10 of units, if not more. So you can imagine now this data center uses millions of these um, transceiver modules, optical transceiver modules. You see here the fibers, right, in yellow. And these are huge data centers. This is the one, for instance, in this in uh, USA, in this, yeah, uh, Google data center, actually. Yeah. And this is huge. It has many buildings. And if we look at one of the, um, of the buildings, all this data needs to be transferred to the outside. How it is done is they pick up trenches with many pipes, and they send all these cables, all the data towards the end users towards other data centers, even within the same data centers or intra data centers. If you have 
like this mood called building, they are even building more. If you look inside one of these pipes, you may wonder, okay, how it looks. It has thousands of fibers. Each of these fibers may be transmitting 100 or 800 gigabit of data, as we saw in the previous slide, if a fiber is connected to one of these um, transceivers. But with the exponential increase of uh, demand, this is predicted to be obsolete. All this infrastructure, if we use it as it is now with such transceivers, this is going to be obsolete. So we need to scale it up. And we need to have the requirement of how to scale it up. We need to come up with some solution that would allow us to transmit data from few meters to hundreds of kilometers that would allow high capacity. So 100 gigabit is, is not enough. We need 100 terabit per second. We need to scale it by a thousand if we want to keep up with the exponential increase of demand. And we don't want to destroy the air. So it needs to be cheap, efficient, and yeah, low power consumption. So the solution is, OK, let's keep improving photonics and come up with something. And one solution is to use massively parallel um, wavelength division multiplexing. Wavelength division multiplexing is what is already used in the transceivers I showed you with four lasers, but you can um, yeah, add much more then you call it massively parallel. In this case, you modulate each of the signals and multiplex them. Right? So that's what I showed before, a couple of slides back. The issue is that in the moment that you are massively parallelizing this, you need to be careful with the stabilization of each laser. You may use a temperature controller or tech, but still, you cannot really put them close to each other because they are individual. And the scales with the genome. So you can imagine if I put 100 of them, how do I put all of the lasers in a small chip? And 100 is what we would need, actually, if not 200. So the solution, or one of the solutions that many researchers work on is to use frequency comms on chip frequency comms. Frequency comm could replace all of these lasers. Why? Because a frequency comm is basically multiple lasers is considered as a device that meets multiple frequencies, such as if you have multiple lasers, but just from one device. And one of the advantages is that all these frequencies that you see here are locked to each other. So they are separated by the same quantity called free spectral range in a way that you can define the position of all of the tones with just two parameters. Um, the center frequency, F0, and the FSR. That reduces considerably the power consumption, it's much more energy efficient, and the footprint, the space it occupies. But we need some requirements. This POM needs to have a high number of carriers. I talk about 100, if not 200. Um, large uh, yeah, free spectral range of tens of gigahertz to accommodate for the 10 or 20 gigabit per second of data, and the high quality, basically low noise, um, high power, low phase noise, and of course, a small size and power efficient. Now, there are many technologies, but if we focus on on-chip, because we want to integrate everything to mass produce it so that it's efficient, we can uh, consider mostly four technologies. So in this slide, I will present to you the four common technologies used to generate frequency comm from an on-chip source. And which have been used already to demonstrate um, data transmission. So this probably is one of the most dense um, slides. Um, one of them is the electro-optic modulator for EO comm. For instance, a silicon organic fabric modulator, that's just one of the examples of electro optic modulator. And the idea is that these waveguides will um, carry the, the light. And when you apply a signal through your GSG uh, configuration, this signal will modulate your light. And you know, if you modulate the light in time, 
in the frequency domain that corresponds to sidebands appearing. So if you modulate with sinusoidal the given frequency, such as 25 gigahertz, then you, you will have some type of frequency coma with tones separated by, by the 25 gigahertz. The problem with this system is that you are limited in bandwidth by your electronics. You are involved in electronics here, so you don't have infinite bandwidth. Um, still, with this type of frequency comb, um, research group has shown um, the data communications of already a terabit per second. So you see already much more than the typical transceivers in data center, but it's limited bandwidth. So how can you improve a little bit this bandwidth? Another technique is the so-called gain switch, laser diode. This technique is a bit more complex because it involves two lasers, one acting as a receiver and the other as um, a master, we call it, that injects the light into the, the receive laser or the slave laser. So you have a slave laser that emits light, and thanks to the master laser, this light is a low, a high quality light. And in addition, you can yeah, yeah, you can modulate the current of this um, this laser diode, and you know if you modulate the, the injected current to the laser, you are modulating the gain of the medium, and you are modulating the output power. And again, in the frequency domain, that's a frequency comb. So if you look in the spectral spectral domain, this modulation leads to a frequency comb, and thanks to the injection of the external laser, you can improve the bandwidth. So that has been also used for data transmission, but still this is limited by the bandwidth of the modulation of this laser. Right? They can, the carriers or the gain of these lasers cannot oscillate really high frequency. So you are basically limited to around 400 gigahertz of bandwidth. How to expand further this bandwidth? Um, that has been shown with a third type of device called mod lock laser diode. You see a mod lock, that's a common technique to generate frequency combs, and they can be used also for integrated systems. So you can have mod locking integrated. Um, one common platform is indium phosphide. So maybe some of you already work with um, mod lock lasers in indium phosphide platform. And with these lasers, so mod lock leads to very small pulses, which in the frequency domain leads to broad frequency comb. So you could obtain frequency combs with more than two terahertz of bandwidth. That has been used to transmit already 10 terabit. You see a factor of 100 with respect to the I show you. However, this has several limitations. One of those is due to the fact that this is a semiconductor laser and as such, the line width here to take as delta f is high so you have high noise and that limits also the transmission also they could be broader because if you know that for optical communications you can transmit over 10 terahertz of bandwidth so terahertz is still not feeling everything and a fourth way to kind of combine everything so that you have a broadband emission and high quality emission is to use micro resonator based um, frequency combs or soliton combs that I will um, explain in a second. In this way, you can generate, if you compare the, the bandwidth, you can generate combs beyond 10 hertz of bandwidth with multiple tones. You cannot see them here because they are very um, close to each other. And that, is, that has been shown to have been used to demonstrate 50 terabit per second. The issue or the limitation is the low uh, power efficiency. So each of these methods um, has a different um, limitation, but they already introduce uh, solutions to overcome the, the scaling problem of optical communication. Um, is there any questions so far? Maybe I can stop for a few seconds if you have, um, if you want to, to interact a bit with the talk. If not, 
I can continue as well. No, okay, then, um, yeah, let's let's continue. Okay, well, then, what about um, frequency comb multiplication? I showed you before one of the techniques is using electro-optic modulator, and the advantage of this technique is that it's very energy efficient compared to the other technique, but it has a low bandwidth limitation. Um, comb multiplication can be achieved also with integrated photonics, and that's some work that we are doing here. Um, so a bit of um, promotion also of our recent uh, work done by Shahab and Mithya, in which we inject a narrow comb, and we show that we can actually multiply at different um, positions, separated by up to uh, 1.3 terahertz, but eventually with the potential of covering up uh, to so 10 terahertz. So besides the raw sources of frequency combs, there can be photonic technologies, photonic ways of improving it, right? Of broadening the comb, of making it more efficient. And um, we also work here in BFOT. And our system would allow for configurable or programmable um, comb multiplication. So we can pick some devices we have integrated in chip, which is the optical feedback, to select where the comb is multiplied. So this is to let you know that there are other, if you are aware of frequency comb sources, there are other techniques to also obtain broader or more efficient frequency combs. And that's integrated on chip already. Yeah. So these are some of the latest results where we show by changing the feedback, we can select around which frequency the comb is, yeah, it's multiplied. And the line width or the, the coherence of this comb is pretty, so it's impressive. And it's separated by one terahertz or even beyond, so this could give also a hint for um, terahertz comb generation with, with applications in the spectroscopy ranging or even terahertz communication, which um, is the last part of, of my talk. So now I want to talk about um, solid and Kerman combs, because if you remember my slide with the four frequency comb sources, this is the one providing the most of the coolest spectrum, right? With hundreds of frequency combs of uh, hundreds of uh, tones and uh, very smooth, very, very beautiful. So I want to kind of explain how this is generated because it's a quite interesting topic. And that's generated with um, Kerr nonlinearity. Um, through a balance of this Kerr nonlinear effect with anomalous group velocity dispersion. And I will talk about this in, in the next slide. But how do you generate in the lab? You may ask. This is, you need a micro resonator, a um, micro comb. And you need to inject high powerful lasers. So you see an amplifier, a polarization controller to adjust the, the polarization, some filter to remove the noise. You have a clean injection and some notch filter to remove the, the, the laser that you inject. And then you get a nice comb with ultra short pulses, providing ultra short pulses or a broadband spectrum. You know, there is a Fourier transform relation. How it works, then you introduce this laser and magically you get um, a broadband frequency comb. Here is the same comb now expanded. So you can see the huge magnitude of of this comb, covering far beyond the, the bands used for optical communication. These are the common C and L bands. If we look into the physics, I told you it's generated through kernel or with, uh, and it starts both um, degenerate or with mixing and non-degenerate. So how it works is you get two, uh, photons from your injected laser. And those two photons will generate uh, two photons with different frequencies, one at omega i and one at omega s. After that, your omega i and omega s will interact before we're mixing to generate uh, further frequencies in a cascading effect. 
So you would start from one of the modes and cascade to generate uh, the frequency code. You, gen you need high Q micro resonators. So that's, those are micro resonators with high efficiency so that you get high power. Why? Because it's a third order linearity. So your power will be very, or the power that you need is huge to be able to observe this nonlinearity. And for that, you need high um, Q factor micro resonators. And then I mentioned that dispersion is also relevant because there is a balance between uh, perfect mixing and dispersion. And that's because the micro resonator is, has um, internal dispersion. And that dispersion is what dictates the shape of the, um, of the frequency cone. At the end, all these effects, you can model them with the so-called Lujato leftover equation. So that's the damp driven nonlinear Schrodinger equation for those of you that study uh, quantum optics. It looks a bit complex, but it has only four terms, basically the dispersion, the nonlinearity, which generate the, the lines, the, the cone tone, the losses, because it's a dissipative medium, and the gain, which is induced by your, um, by your external light. And combining all of these phenomena is what leads you to a solid tone in short term. Of course, if you're more interested, interested in this topic, I can give you more details after, after the talk, but it's basically a balance of these four phenomena. How do you use a solid tone for optical communication? Well, you have many lines, hundreds of lines. You need to demultiplex them and use modulators to encode data in each of them individually, independently, and then multiplex them and you can transmit them through uh, tens of kilometers. This is how we look, for instance, the, the, the data at uh, this point. And then at the receiver, you demodulate them to cover the data. In an experiment, it was used with 179 of these uh, tones in different modulation formats, leading to 50 terabits per second. That's the number I told you before. Um, it is high, so we need to, but also it's energy efficiency. You study the energy consumption of this um, system. It leads to a value, which is typically given in picojoules per bit, of around yeah, between 1.5 and 4 picojoules per bit. And that's comparable with the device I showed you before, the transceiver, um, which consumes around 20 picojoules per bit with the laser consuming around 10 picojoules per bit. This is difficult to know because they don't give the, the, the details, but it's estimated around this value. So it's already 500 times the consumption and more energy cons uh, efficient. The issue is that this is um, not integrated of the components, only the frequency comb source. So what's the vision? The vision would be to have everything integrated so that you can mass produce it. And you see here a beautiful image of the vision containing the micro resonator with a laser that is used to generate the comb, containing the multiplexer, containing the modulator, the multiplexer, and the fiber. And here connected with wire bonds, for instance. This is the vision, but is this vision realistic? Um, quickly going through the progress over the last years, there has been a huge increase on, on this um, technology and the advance of this technology. In particular, you We've seen in the last year, frequency comb generated directly from battery. So they hook up a AAA battery to their system to drive the laser to generate the frequency comb. Of course, it's narrow, it's low power and so on, but come on, it's generated from battery. Now, the issue of these combs is the efficiency is very, very low. I didn't mention so far, but the efficiency is below 1%. That means that less than 1% of the energy, optical energy you inject is transferred to the frequency cone. That's because it's a chi 3 uh, third order nonlinear process. But there are the so-called dark solitons. This is a more exotic, fancy type of frequency cone that can be obtained also in, in micro resonators. And they have shown to, to obtain 20% conversion efficiency, that's a factor of 20. So that there is a huge potential in this technology. And of course, overall, the technology of photonics, integrated photonics, lithography techniques is increasing as exponentially. And every time the Q factors increase, which would lead to more efficiency, low power thresholds, and so on. So there is kind of realistic 
What about the modulators? They are also being integrated. In this example, you can see four IQ modulators, so pairs of modulators, integrated and connected to later. And already they have been demonstrated terabit per second with the transmission with systems where the, everything is connected with photonic wireboard, maybe so, um, nanoscribe technology, if you're aware of photon lithography. So it's there. Um, the next question is, okay, any way to even increase further capacity, more than 50, maybe 50 terabits is okay for the next 10 years, but what about the next 20, 30 years? You want better, if not more. Well, for that, we can play with the um, physical dimensions of the light. Your light has polarization, um, has frequency, phase, and so on. So you can modulate everything. And typically what is done is you modulate the amplitude and the phase, you modulate the polarization, and maybe you can modulate other things. But the new exotic thing is to use space modulation that involves using multiple fibers or multiple modes. So instead of having the common uh, fiber with just one core, you could have fibers each with one core. You could have a fiber with seven cores, or you could have a fiber with three cores, but big, so that allows multiple modes, and so on. And lately it has been shown, yes, 2021, so two years ago, they have reached 10 petabit per second. That's crazy. That's with just one fiber. But this fiber is special. It's a fiber with a few modes. In particular, they use this fiber here with, I don't know, around 20, yeah, 25 cores, and each core allowing multiple modes. So they optimize it because if you have too many cores, there is crosstalk between the cores, so you lose the signal. So there, there is a really huge, uh, huge potential there using optics and photonics. Um, yeah, we can also consider wavelength conversion. Maybe we want flexible network, not a network with huge amount of data. And that's also a work we are doing here and Shahab and Diksha to show that we can use photonic integrated circuits for wavelength conversion, switching uh, data uh, between wavelengths separated by more than terahertz. And we've shown lately um, this work of 1.3 terahertz. Okay, quickly, that leads me to, or I leave the world of fiber and in a couple of minutes, hopefully not more, I want you to give a, yeah, an over, overall picture of wireless. So far we look into fiber, but how can photonics impact the world of uh, wireless communication? Well, we are reaching now five generations uh, wireless communications, but six is coming in less than 10 years. And that would require high speed rate so terabit per second, low latency, and so on. Um, you already see these type of models, yeah, spread, widespread around the whole city. Um, with the coming of 6G, these models need to be adapted to more speed and also to orient the beam. So these things come in just in. in. What does 5G mean? 5G. Work that works at frequencies of um, around five to six gigahertz, but expected in the next few years to go to 30 gigahertz and a bit beyond. But with 6G, which would be deployed in the 30s, and yeah, maybe the 40s also, we expect to go beyond 30 gigahertz, uh, beyond 300 gigahertz. And for that, electronics cannot manage. So we do really need um, photonics that we enter the world of terahertz. How it works now, using the most common example at 2.5 gigahertz and WLAN, VLAN, is that you have multiple channels, so similar to the case of fiber, but now you have channels with a smaller um, frequency, so 20 megahertz bandwidth, centered at around 2.5 gigahertz. That's, for instance, the data that your mobile receives. So the channel width is around 20 megahertz, maybe 160, depending if you use the five gigahertz frequency. And they use quadrature amplitude modulation, so they change the phase and the amplitude of the signal. So you can reach a gigabit per second in each of these channels. So you can really have high speed wireless community uh, communication. 
but the channels are getting filled because every time more devices need this you need to think of internet of things it's exponentially increasing so we need to really go to terahertz there is no other solution we need to use more bandwidth but how do we get a carrier which is now at 2.5 gigahertz the terahertz frequency we need to use photonics and heterogyny it's a technique that is going to go widely spread in the next year that you will see in your community with the towers. In a nutshell, how it works is you need to heterodyne two signals. One, come in your data, so you encode your data into a with a modulator into an optical carrier, frequency F0, and another data, another signal, optical signal, coming from your so-called local oscillator. You join them and you send them to a photodiode where heterodyning takes place. So you see the original signal, which is at, at terahertz. And after, sorry, you see your two signals, F0 and FLO, after eating in the photodiode, you get the terahertz signal when they are separated by a terahertz frequency, maybe 300 gigahertz then. So at the transmitter, which is this section, you transfer a baseband signal from your at the signal generator to the optical domain. And then through heterodyne, you bring it to the terahertz domain, maybe around 300 gigahertz. And then at the receiver, you do the reverse, you bring your terahertz signal to the optical in a high speed match in the modulator. You encode the data into an optical carrier, so you bring it to the optical domain, and then a photodiode to bring it back to the baseband. And already with this technique, uh, few years, two or three years ago, 50 gigabit per second was shown just with one channel, right? Now we have a different signal. One work that we are doing also here in, in our group is to process this uh, terahertz signal because you may want to filter one channel. You can change your device in your phone. And we are developing a, some type of terahertz processor unit, unit based on integrated photonics. Um, so called multi weapon laser. Um, so we aim at to be able to process broadband terahertz um, signals. Um, we have already some uh, preliminary results on filtering or processing um, continuous wave lasers, not signals. So we want to expand it to, to really signals. Okay, with this, um, I come to the conclusion. So I show you that. There is a whole world behind the internet and um, information technology community that basically can be divided into fibers and wireless, and how there are issues in each of them, bottlenecks that we really need to overcome because technology is not going to stop. And we need to provide solutions for that. And photonics um, can help both at long distances and even to, to short distances, and both in fiber and wireless um, communication. So photonic could be really the only solution. And one thing I skip, if you look at this part, I talk about data centers, long distance communications, is this small part here. Well, that I skip because it's really the latest research is still a bit unknown if it's gonna work. So the future is, can we call it smaller? Can we really have chip to chip communications using photonics? I mean, we could, but is it efficient? Is it better than electronics? That's the question that is still unclear. Um, IBM, Intel, all these big electronic companies of processor generators and so on are working on that actually because they see the future there. And there are already some demonstration uh, demonstrators of um, 240 gigabit per second by directional chip to chip transmission and even on chip transmission, which there are still no examples. But here you see a nice vision of IBM. That image really was popular back uh, 12 years ago. So how they foresee their processors, where they would have a directly on top of the process layer. Why? Because if you know about processors, you know that the bottleneck there is the communication. The processors have now billions of transistors, so they can really generate terabit of data, but you cannot throw them out. There is no physical 
possibility because of the wire. They told you the limit bandwidth and the power consumption destroys the signal. So there is a lot of potential, but communicating with the memory and other peripherals is limited. And optics could solve that. But controlling optics at this small, um, yeah, small size is, is still, um, I'm still not sure how, how it's gonna go. Okay, with that, I can, I would like to finish my talk and thank you everyone for, for and to me, I hope it was interesting and you have nice um, take home messages. Thank you very much, Pablo. Ah, that's it. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you very much for your presentation. Um, now we can um, go into the session of questions, if you have any. Maybe I can go first. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Pablo, for the great presentation. It was very interesting, a bit out of topic for me, but it was nevertheless very, very interesting. Um, so my question is a bit more toward the general uh, case of things, like what would you say is the biggest barrier in the path of implementation of these new optical communication technologies? So you said a lot of uh, different approaches uh, are there to break the limitations that we already have in our current implementations. But then like, what's the barrier there that is keeping these new technologies that are being developed every day to become a norm in uh, current state of the things? For example, why don't I have that uh, one terabyte, uh, terabyte per second internet right now? Yeah, when you talk about the new photonic technologies, such as using frequency comms, for instance, the thing is the reliability and the yield. Um, these big companies that fabricate the transceivers, right, such as the, the one, I think it was like slide 10, yeah, to be economically viable, they need to fabricate millions of them, right? You know, these big ASML and these huge companies, they will never go for something that is still not mature enough to guarantee high yield and reliability for frequency and these new photonic technologies, uh, they are still not reliable. And we send them for fabrication to a lithography to, to a car. They come, one device performs great, the other less. You need to stabilize them in temperature. You need to operate them different. So they are not as reproducible as we would like, mostly if you go to very complex system where you would integrate everything, right? The GL is still not there. Um, I showed the vision that um, we would have with um, fully integrated transceiver. Um, here, right? You would say, okay, it sounds great. Let's connect everything. But I remember, I mean, I wasn't involved in the connection per se, but my PhD colleagues, some of them were working on that, interconnecting these different platforms as you see here. And they were really struggling because they draw wire bonds, maybe using the minus drive machine or a similar one. And you need several, but maybe one doesn't work. It, it gives you already 10 dB of losses, then you screw up the whole system. Right, so the, the, the yield is still an issue. But it's being developed, right? the technology is advancing. When I go and meet my previous colleagues and other companies working on that, they always say, yeah, now we guarantee 99% of this and the other. So maybe maybe we'll be see all this technology soon, but it still needs to be sure that it is reliable and cheaper. Uh, Do you think the fact that you show like a lot of buildings filled with this optical communication and stuff. Like, do you think that's a factor that they have to replace these things uh, in order to uh, implement these new technologies? Well, that they do would replace. be expensive, wouldn't it? Yeah, they, they do replace um, continuously because they will replace by better receivers. 
I show you the, the example of 100 um, gigabit per second transceiver. But um, yeah, this one. But of course, when the 800 gigabit uh, becomes uh, much cheaper and, and efficient, they, they do trans, um, uh, they do change. I remember one um, talk that I attended from uh, yeah, a person from, from the Google data center. He actually mentioned that one of the main issues or bottlenecks is actually something that you mentioned, um, changing, so disconnecting and connecting. I mean, you have millions of connections and they were struggling to find someone like a startup or a company that could automate that. It's very hard, like it's still not. They, this, the talk was three or four years ago and the guy was really asking the audience, can someone please automate this? So <laughs> if you find a way yeah, of automation, then, it's, then it could be more easy to explain, yes. Yeah. Uh, Thank you so much, Paolo. Is there another question? That it? You hear me there? Yes. <laughs> yeah, um, well, amazing. I, I mean, I, I discovered New Pablo actually today for me, although we sit next to each other for a couple of years already. Very amazing. And my question is that what do we need in Bitcoin? to fabricate a ring resonator, I mean, what are the parameters of a ring resonator to get dark soliton content? Yeah, you need normal version. Yeah. And high quality, which doesn't come together. Um, a high quality structure was like 10 to 6. Yeah, oh, that's more than enough. Yeah, yeah. Because now with Nanostar, we are already getting rings with 10 I don't know about this person. Yeah, yeah. that's something that, that uh, you need to know. Who works on interconnection? I know. And uh, why not? Can we try to do it also? Yeah, well, I really like that because I mean, we, we need the modulators. That is a bit difficult, but yeah, why not? <laughs> But we are also soon getting the nano tracer. It can help to do these wire things and stuff like that. Or, the, or maybe also fabricate more, more complicated components. Papers. Okay. Uh -huh. It's feasible. Well, many research groups have tried that. And the group I was back in um, Germany, in Karlsruhe, they are starting to give up a bit. So I can tell you that it involves a lot of research, right? You need to combine all this technology. And many of the money you get to do the research comes from projects. This project lasts five years. Maybe you can ask for the continuation of the project, then you have maybe eight, nine, 10 years max. Uh, the project about the, the transceiver that I showed you started more or less when I, one year before I started my PhD. So it has been already eight years or, or so. And um, they are changing topic to terahertz photonics because it's a hot topic. I mean, now um, if you look at the, the graphic of the energy consumption, the net so applications is also becoming a really hot topic. Um, but I think if we all sit together, yeah, really, maybe yeah. these heads together, maybe we can come up with something because I know that for the nano fabrication was a problem, problem because it's still missing something there. And now I think this year is nano fabrication. Indeed. And it can also help to. Uh, yeah. Indeed. Indeed. After the meeting. <laughs> 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 Super. Uh, any other questions? Yes. Okay. Uh, the, that was an amazing uh, presentation, but uh, I've got a question. That you said this uh, technology is becoming advancing. It is advancing. 
and uh, uh, I read about the fiber optic cable. Uh, it is easily fragile and it's very expensive. Do you think this will be easily affordable when it becomes ready in the future? I think I get which part is expensive. The cables, everything, the installation part. Ah, yeah, the cable itself, no? You have these yeah. huge towers that must produce kilometers of cable, yeah. and that, that, that's very cheap. What I meant that was expensive was, um, so if you see this image, having to place millions of those cables in an automated way. Now, if you want to, to change the, the cables, I mean, they will not change them. That, that, that's impossible. You need millions, uh, thousands of manpower uh, hours. Um, so that's the expensive part, but the fiber itself is very cheap. And if you place it, what you want to do now is use that infrastructure and exploit it to the maximum. How, for instance, frequency comes and model, high order modulation for. So the idea is to really exploit that to the maximum, this infrastructure that's already placed there that has cost us billions of euros. I mean, the ICT industry is, if not the high, the biggest, like in the first or second, I mean, there is automotive industry, ICT industry, but they, they manage billions, trillions of euros. Um, we want to reuse this infrastructure, right? And efficient way to use it is photonic technology could allow for this efficient way. I don't know if that answers the, the question. Uh, you have a follow-up, maybe? Uh, I didn't mean for the old uh, photonic uh, fiber optic cables, but I mean for the copper cables. New world order, we need to change the copper cables. Yeah, that fiber optic cable. And I think it is very expensive, uh, especially for the third world countries, mainly in Africa. Mm -hmm. To replace the copper cables, it depends on which scale. If it's at the scale of tens of meters or kilometers, then that can be done. And I know some countries, because I was um, during my PhD, I shared office with some countries from Africa, some colleagues from African countries, like Ethiopia, Gabon, and things like that. And so told me that as they start from kind of zero in terms of ICT, they use the latest technology. So sometimes they even have a better internet connectivity than we do in Europe, because we use still archaic uh, internet connectivity. So copper at large scale is already basically gone. You have not many places Okay, there could be exceptions and so on, but the um, legacy of DSL and ADSL is kind of over. Um, but if you think about the processors and computers, CPUs and so on, there you, you cannot replace it. That was my last slide. Uh, that the future is very difficult because processors probably are never going to be replaced. They, they perform operations of teraflops per second. So the photonics cannot compete. I mean, the, the, trans, the, the transistors are nanometer scale. Photonic devices that I showed, these micro resonators are hundreds of micrometers. They are million times bigger. You, you cannot compete with that. So at lower scale, very difficult. At large scale, it's just time. And um, I don't know your specific case um, of the country, so I cannot know, but um, yeah, optics is replacing almost uh, um, from Ethiopia. From Ethiopia, I had Ethiopian uh, colleagues, many of them, and they were some of them told me that, like, look, in some part uh, the connectivity is even bigger, uh, better than in Germany. Yeah. Germany is famous for really bad connectivity because they use archaic infrastructure with DSL, ADSL, and also the digging up trenches to place the fibers is extremely expensive in Munich and big cities in Germany. So you can imagine. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you for the Spanish. Um, we have uh, time for maybe one last question. Mm, yes. No. Okay. So I want to thank again Pablo for his nice presentation. And uh, I would like to ask you for something before you all leave. 
Um, maybe if Pablo can leave uh, his uh, first slide and uh, you turn on. Oops, sorry. Yes, can you hear me? You turn on your cameras and we take a quick ah. <laughs> picture before we all leave. <laughs> Thank you. I didn't look. Yeah. Martin, yoo-hoo. <laughs> um, and in the meantime, while the others uh, turn on your cameras, um, um, I, I would like to say that uh, keep, uh, um, yeah, just uh, uh, stay uh, tuned for the next uh, uh, events we have uh, and we, that we are um, organizing as the BFOT student chapter uh, that are coming soon and they're going to be super nice. So, okay, I will then uh, take the picture at one, two, three. Okay. Super, thank you very much. <laughs> and um, thanks for participating. And also, if you want to um, give a presentation, don't hesitate and contact us uh, for the future and we can arrange something. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 I don't know how to live. <laughs> Bye. 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 I will kick you out. <laughs> bye bye.